Professor Howard Williams takes you on a journey through time and space, exploring death and memory, past and present. Archeodeath. Welcome to part two of my talk, Offers Dyke a Watery Perspective, to be delivered to the Chester Society for Landscape History with a follow-up live session in a few weeks. So um, if you're... A if this is you, you, you're clicking on this now, uh, please go back and look at part one beforehand, where I go through the broader context of the why we should look at Offa's Dyke from a watery perspective in terms of its interactions with streams, rivers, uh, wetlands and coastlines and the sea, um, because um, that will provide you with the broader context of other earthworks in the early Middle Ages that are built to manage and, and, and uh, communicate and control movement through and along and across water. So um, there's a broader context to that to be looked at before we embark on the second half of the presentation. Now, I must admit, it only was quite recently that I started thinking about Offers Dyke in watery terms and in a very bizarre and interesting context, because this is Offers Dyke water washed by uh, the 18th century ornamental lake in Chirk Park, uh, where it is basically usually underwater. Um, but because of the low water levels in 2018, uh, the dike came to the surface as the lake was slowly evaporating, uh, therefore revealing it like a sort of leviathan coming to the surface for the first time and it got me thinking about the parts of valley bottoms where the dike has long been washed away but once the the dike would have been cutting across blocking those uh, valleys those watercourses perhaps apart from narrow controlled channels um, so so it made me think about this this question in more detail now um, we another place that uh, inspired me is this one. This is where Offa's Dyke survives and its ditch enhanced by the flow of a stream coming down the south facing, therefore the northward slope of the Clywedog River Valley um, in Bersham, uh, Plas Power Estate. So this is uh, Nant Mill, for those of you who know it, for walks. Um, and many people walk along this path and cross over Offa's Dyke without perhaps realising it. But if you look left and northwards, um, you will see the bank and ditch. It's hugely, massively monumental, um, probably as big as it ever was, if not bigger, because of the erosion caused by the stream, using the stream as it descends um, as part of its defences. And then a wonderful stretch of Offa's Dyke that survives, cutting across the river valley itself. And this is the stream running down um, its... Uh, western facing side so this is another reason another local site that got me interested in looking at the water interactions of offers dyke and walking along offers dyke in the winter rather than most what most people do in the summer i noticed that water does collect in it of course and therefore water would have perhaps filled the ditch in many locations and there are also some significant situations where the dike blocks off the natural flow of water and there's been ponding of water ever since on its western side so water may have actually been part in at least in small part of, of its defenses and how it would have appeared to people in the early middle ages not everywhere but in the valley bottoms and on the valley tops on the hilltops um, there would have been significant ponding of water and the, um, and a flow of water along the line of the dike. Um, and of course, there are places where the dike is related to key water courses. This is the famous view from the Devil's Pulpit towards Tinton Abbey on the left, and um, also um, uh, a view showing you the Clun River uh, and being at the point where the, the Offers Dyke path crosses it on a small bridge today, but where uh, Offers Dyke would have would have encountered the, the water course looking east there. Um, and Keith Ray and Ian Bapti in their 2016 book does al already make the point that where the, the dike here in red uh, transposed onto the Ordnance Survey map, where it crosses the uh, Lug River, um, just to the north of Discoid Farm, um, you can see that I've, I've painted over the uh, in darker blue the line of the the lug, so it's clearer. Um, but also, you can see how not only does Offers Dyke drop down from the valley sides and cross over at a very specific location, at which is subsequently a weir, where multiple streams uh, co um, 
conjoin with the lug. In other words, um, it, it it doesn't cross to the west of that line. It tries to reduce the number of river crossings it has to um, negotiate. But in addition, how it's using the stream as part of its defence, shall we say, on its western side, uh, on the western side as it approaches from the south, but also the, how it may have actually its building may have um, retained and 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 redirected the confluence from a point further to the east. So, in many ways, Offus Dyke is enshrining and perhaps enhancing existing hydraulic relationships. And we have to think about whether this was um, not only part of its deliberate design, but also allowed it to control the power of that water for mills and for other features, uh, other, other uses to the east. So, Water is here a resource as well as a landscape barrier that it's the, and, and a route of communication is being blocked and controlled by the line of the dike. So um, Ray, Ray and Bapti describe the approach as, as the dike would have operated as a low dam across the river valley. And I think that's one of the most important points in the existing literature where archaeologists have sort of thought about uh, the behaviour of Offa's dike in relation to water courses. Now, I want to pursue as my part of my presentation uh, six ways in which I think Offers Dyke worked as a watery feature, as a hydraulic um, device, building on that earlier work and that broader early medieval context outlined in part one. Firstly, I want to suggest that the dyke may have not run from sea to sea, as Asser, the biographer of Alfred the Great, suggested. Um, I'm not saying it's purely rhetoric, though, either. Um, because I would suggest even if the monument didn't go right to the sea, um, it operated in relation to key rivers, estuaries and seaward communication. And it was created as defensible and as surveilling um, these communication routes uh, for trade and martial use. And it does that twice with the D. Uh, both at, it, at, at its estuary, because even if Offa's Dyke didn't go further north than Hope Mountain and, and uh, uh, Troythen, it w had reached a point where it could control views over and communication along the D estuary. And then, of course, the D as it, it uh, spills out of the Vale of Clangothlan, then the Vunwy, then the Severn, and then the Y. And it does the Severn twice, of course, once where it crosses it. Um, at its, you know, at its higher parts, but then also again where it hits the Severn estuary. So in um, that regard, there's at least five, two estuaries and three major rivers of Britain that Offa's Dyke is controlling movements along. And for two of those watercourses, it does it twice with its est with estuaries and with its higher stretches of those rivers. And in fact, there's a nice symmetry between the D and the seven in that functioning of the dike. So um, we've already sh shown this, but I want to reiterate that that riverine as well as landward communication routes, as Malim's map makes clear, that the dike would have been controlling. And that, I think, is very absolutely integral to the Mercian frontier zone not thinking about the dike as, and this is what Keith Ray and Ian Bapti argue, thinking about it in relation to a zone rather than as a line in the landscape. And we can see that best at the southern end of Offa's Dyke, where Offa's Dyke not only follows the line of the Y, therefore controlling the Y, and we'll come back to that, but then jumps across at its southern end to face off on the cliffs of Sebury over the River Severn. So at this location, I would suggest Offa's Dyke is, 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 focus, is, is facing westwards in our understanding, but also south and eastwards through the control of the Tidenham uh, um, area, Tuts Hill, I mean, sort of Lookout Hill, um, Buttington Tump and the Beachley Peninsula. It's controlling both the Y and the Severn, not simply facing Wales across the Y, as some people would characterise this. Therefore, it's utterly operating, completely operating in riverine and estuarine terms. 
this is the final section of Offers Dyke leading up to the Sebury Cliffs, where what what Offers Dyke looked at this location uh, looked like at this location overlooking the Severn is is speculation. It may be watchtowers, a fort, beacons, and perhaps some you know monumental feature, so that it actually was able to use the natural cliffs. And this is the cliffs as seen uh, in by Ormerod in the 1850s. The cliffs are operating as the monument. It's it's incorporating that topography. Now this is a map I've I'm, uh, is still in progress, and I, I I'm willing to accept criticisms and qualifications to it. I have a sip of my tea, my Offers Dyke tea. Actually, I haven't got my I've got my Shakespeare swearing mug, not my Offers Dyke uh, Association mug. But anyway, I should have thought of that. Oh, I've got an old cup of tea here. I've got to promote the Offers Dyke Association. There you are. Look at that. Beautiful. That's old. That's cold tea. Let's not go down that road. I digress. Sorry. Um, here, uh, a map I'm in the process of con constructing to articulate and visualise what I mean about the sea scape context and estuarine context of the dike. So in this map, you have Offers Dyke in, um, in yellow. And you have um, Watts Dyke in green, which does extend to the D estuary. You've got Litchfield and Tamworth and Mercia. The subsidiary peoples that were being absorbed into Mercia in the 7th and early 8th centuries, but may have still had discrete, if not in political independence, certainly discrete regional identities. The Magansata, the Roxansata, the Huicha, um, the peoples being faced by Offers Dyke in traditional terms. Uh, Helen Worthington would say, argue mainly Powys, but potentially other uh, emergent or um, enduring local regional identities um, from Ergin, uh, Gwent, Powys, and then to Gynel and Rose. But to also make the point that, that Offers Dyke is speaking to a broader landscape and seascape audience of communication routes and and connections to Cornwall, Southwest Wales, Ireland, Northwest Wales, Man, Southwest Scotland, Cumbria, and the the Northumbrian the, well, it was that time the Northwest of England, the Northumbrian Kingdom. And if anything, I would say in terms of control, communication and audience, Offers Dyke is working here in relation to seascape communication routes and estuarine communication routes. As much with Ireland and the Irish Sea, the Bristol Channel and the South West, but also with its powerful rivals in Wessex and Northumbria. And I would say that therefore this Western linear earthwork often visualised and mapped as a, but about a proto-relationship between England and Wales, when seen from this perspective, suddenly takes on a different uh, significance as a monument that's about articulating relationships between and controlling relationships between Mercia as a central British polity and a wider British and Anglo-Saxon world. Uh, of west of the western british context and ireland should not be ignored in this regard either so that's work ongoing but that's my first point about the broader context my second point is that in many points at many points the dyke utilizes rivers as an integral part of its landscape and this is the y valley and if we're thinking about the dyke in the y valley we have to think about it not only as a bank and ditch evidence of quarry ditches behind maybe a counter scarp um, um maybe all sorts of other minor watchtowers and beacons we'd also need to think about it as transforming the entire landscape the stripping of all those those valley sides for tree of trees and of utilising the river itself as part of its line. So in this, these kind of environments, rivers become the monuments as much as the valley sides and the line of the bank and ditch itself. The, 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 the rivers are becoming the monuments. And Ray and Bapti identify the key locations along its route of the Dee, the Van Wee, the, the Severn and the Y, where the, the river may have actually been the frontier. So the key stances of Offers Dyke, and this is this is to show this in my newly constructed maps of where we, we can trace the line of Offers Dyke with some certainty, if not exact um, um, exactitude in some places, 
as it hits the Severn uh, um, at Buttington to the south and at Dowas um, to the north. And therefore, in this stretch between, uh, the Severn is operating as the frontier. Now, whether it had palisades, watchtowers along that line of the river, we don't know. Um, it's all washed away, but we can see that um, the, the, the the dike is going down and reorientating at Buttington to hit the D, uh, the, the Severn, and then likewise some miles to the north, departing from it at a location that uh, allows it to follow streams to hit up the higher ground. Oh, forgive me. And here, um, this is um, uh, 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 where the Vunwe is utilised in a comparable way for a very short distance, but at a strategic location before um, the, the dike rises up to Asterley Rocks. And this is another interesting location where the, the D gets utilised as part of the line of the dike between Hopyard Wood, which is the supposed line where the dike follows down and joins the D, although that's not conclusively identified on the ground. But what is, it's opposite Tiamauer Country Park, uh, where Offers Dyke da descends from the Cherk Estate down and through um, across the cut by the, uh, the Clangotham Canal. So the last point in the north, you can actually see Offers Dyke from the Offers Dyke path and then hits the D at some dramatic river cliffs. And this is the um, Kevin Mauer viaduct, but this is the river cliff where Offers Dyke is actually hitting. Um, so its choice of where to hit the D is, is not arbitrary. It's so that the D becomes part of that face-off against the um, Western, in this case, Northern, uh, you know, um, enemies and uh, um, peoples. Now, this showing in the Northern stretch of Watts Dyke in relation to Offers Dyke, it makes the point that a third strategy we can see is as well as using the river as the line, um, you know, the, the the line is where the, the off, Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke more does this more than, than even Offers Dyke in the North. You know, dominates over river valleys. Here's a good example where you see a transition from a river um, a river overlooking to a river blocking mode of Offers Dyke. And this is at Garthen Lodge. The Avon Gogh, where from the north, uh, the Offers Dyke follows along and dominates the river. And then it crosses the river, shifts angle dramatically to then behave differently in relation to the next stream that it crosses, the Avon Ida, um, uh, where instead of following it, it blocks it at a very specific location where it can have a control of west-east passage. If it crossed anywhere to the east or the west, it would have to cross the river in a more difficult way, a more challenging way at an angle. But here it chooses a perpendicular crossing point. So it's a very precisely lined monument. And this is another example. This is where um, Offers Dyke is overlooking the Morder, uh, a smaller river, but still using the water course as part of its its defensive framework, but then decides to block the river and continue its line southwards. A first point, a fourth point, sorry, about how Offers Dyke interacts with water courses is its blocking strategy. And we saw two examples of adaption between an overlooking and a blocking strategy. Let's look at some of these lines. And here in the north, I've just put some dots on maps of small circles for minor river water courses and then big dots for bigger water courses where the monument blocks uh, across water courses and off what Stike has to do it fewer times because it's on lower ground and that may be part of the reason why some people say what Stike is better designed and better considered because it has fewer river blockings or stream blockings to achieve in its line uh, compared with at least in this northern section off Stike has to do this a lot and you can see that here, um, Offers Dyke has a mean of every 2.6 kilometres, it, it has to block a stream. Here is an example. This is the Morlus at Greignant, and a bit of peppered snow on the ground there from a few years ago. And this is Offers Dyke blocking um, the river. This is looking westwards uh, from the, the eastern side of Offers Dyke. But you can see how the monument is blocking across the valley there. Here's another example from the Clun Forest, Eden Hope Hill. This is the River Unk. Um, and I've obviously I've painted it in so that you can see where the line of the river is and the, the, the very monumental survivor of the dike 
wrapping down and cr crossing the river and ascending onto um, the next hill. Um, so you get that sense of the river blocking, the blocking of the valleys, controlling movement along the valleys. Here are some examples to show how precise and careful this alignment is. And the dike is being surveyed in relation to water crossings, uh, river crossings, um, where it looks like it's, oh, it doesn't mind, it's just going to block that river valley. But actually, look, it's very careful where it does it. If here at the Gwenfro, um, this is just west of Wrexham, if Offers Dyke had been lower on the lower ground, it would have had to have dealt with a complex situation of, 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 of smaller streams and, and, and would have had to have been looking uphill a lot, a lot further. If it had gone further west... It would have had to have negotiated much higher ground. Instead, it, it very carefully chooses where to drop down at Vron Farm um, to cross the Gwenfro. So it's not even a big stream, but it's thought very carefully about where it will navigate it. And the Clywedog, just to the south, um, it makes it. This is where I showed you at Nant Mill, where it adapts the use of a little stream on its northern side. A clear decision is made to drop it away from Nant Mill and not cross here and therefore have to then navigate all these streams, but to drop it down slope to cross at a point where perpendicular to the Clywedog, it's perhaps the only point where it can do a perpendicular crossing to the Clywedog, and then heads to Cadogan Hall, allowing it to only cross two watercourses as opposed to one, two, three, four, five, six or four or five. OK, so it's very carefully considered, surveyed. And I think if there's one factor above all else that dominates the surveying choices of Offers Dyke, it might not be hills and view sheds west. It may be where it can strategically cross rivers. So overlooking rivers, point four is blocking rivers. And here I've already showed you at the, uh, uh, the Kerryog offers dyke descending and blocking the Kerryog River and it looks like it's going in a straight line but actually it's carefully as Keith Ray and Ian Bapti argue carefully negotiating topography to cross at a very strategic location and here again using a, a stream on the steep slope as it's part of its western defence. Two more examples of river blocking behaviours, a Pentra Bucken, where again, you can just sat at this Kedogan farm, which we saw before. But here at Pentra Bucken, uh, carefully choosing to be positioned and cross the, um, uh, the Pentra Bucken book just to the east of multiple confluences, therefore making its role more strategic, more careful and allowing a perpendicular crossing. And here, um, the darker colours of the topography, because it's a much higher landscape, uh, Greig Nant, this is what I showed you in the photograph looking east from about here. You can see how it's blocking the Morlass Brook just where um, just east of where multiple confluences. So the care and attention to placing of the monument has already been argued by multiple scholars. But the watery dimensions that we can really see in these comparative maps more clearly than there has been before. My fifth point is contentious, and this is something I'm still playing with the idea of. There are some points, however, where Offers Dyke behaves differently. And because we've identified a pattern in how the dyke behaves um, elsewhere, we can actually suggest that this is a, a deliberate and significant choice. And there must be reasoning, a different reasoning or logic behind how it behaves in relation to these watercourses. I've called these dike islands. Now, this is at Frith. This is a very interesting location because Offers Dyke decides to do, to, to, it's been working for miles to reach the heights of Mount Zion, allowing wonderful views westwards, eastwards as well. Offers Dyke is about views east and west, actually. It's not just about looking westwards. But then it drops down into the Kekidog Valley. But it decides not to go up onto Hope Mountain, which I think is important because I think Hope Mountain is a key strategic location in the northern um, vistas um, that Offers Dyke is trying to control and communication routes is trying to manage. Link and from Offers uh, Hope Mountain, you can see across the Mersey and the Dee and control the whole of that coastal plain. So even if Offers Dyke doesn't go much further north than this as a monument, I think its positioning here is about controlling that, that estuarine and coastal plain. But what's interesting is it doesn't decide to go up onto Hope Mountain, but to follow the Kedagog, follow the, make the river its uh, part of its frontier. But what is striking here is that when it drops from Mount Zion, it doesn't do what it should do, in my view. 
This is arguable. You know, we can say it based on assumptions of what we think it should be doing. But an easier task for the surveyors and the builders would have been to drop Offers Dyke down and cross, as it has done in previous examples I've shown you repeatedly, east of confluences with multiple streams and then follow at a low contour that, and utilise the Kedagog from that point where it has a relatively perpendicular, like at the Avon Gogh, it changes direction here and then follows the river on. It doesn't. It decides to take a little tweak to the significant tweak westwards and drop down and block the, all of these different streams. Why would it do that and behave differently here? Well, there are clues. Firstly, Frith has been is the only site that's demonstrably excavated and shown a relative dating relationship between Offers Dyke and archaeological features. And this is excavations by Cecil Fox, who excavated at Frith, which was the site of a Roman station on a east well east northeast west southwest Roman road coming from Dewa, uh, coming from Chester. So this location may have been significant still, even uh, maybe it was just a ruin or may have had significance. And Offers Dyke wanted to incorporate the site of the Roman station, in fact, run across it. But there's another, it may be the power of the past and tradition that meant that uh, the monument behaved differently here. But there may be another functioning to it. The other, the point I would make is that by running itself across the river valley, it is naturally creating at least three pockets of defensible um, pasture land or valley bottom grazing um, between the river and the dike. How was that space used, if at all? Well, my argument would be that would be a wonderful place to create a, a mustering site for riders, for horse riding. Uh, uh, in other words, a war band. Uh, for collecting tribute in form of stock uh, in terms of sheep, goats, geese, <laughs> cattle, whatever you might think, you know, animals, you know, brought west from the west for trading as tribute, as trade and tribute. This would be a, a secure place to sh for short terms to to gather those materials. So it's like a, maybe a sort of a, a riverine fort type arrangement for a, a collection of animals for onward transportation eastwards as, as trade tra tribute. Um, and in addition to that, therefore, you're creating a secure valley bottom space for assembly, for potentially gatherings of people. Um, so are we looking at uh, offers like behaving this way to protect nothing dramatic or monumental, but to protect a space where you can securely keep people and animals, corral them, transport them? There are other locations where Offers Dyke behaves in this way, and they're also very dramatic. So there's Burfa Bank, Iron Age Hillfort, that may have been reused and expanded in the uh, part of Offers Dyke, but that's been, we can't prove that. Here's the line of Offers Dyke taking a lowland route, crossing two streams, and then rising up and dramatically encapsulating Herrick Hill and Rushick Hill before heading off across the Herefordshire Plain. A major shift of stance for the dyke, as everyone would agree. But one of the features people haven't discussed is the fact that if it ran across the River Valley at this point between the Riddings and the Hindwell Brooks um, and just east of Burfa Bog, you are allowing this area, particularly the area in the sort of at the confluence of these streams, to be a defensible, corralable uh, lowland meadow. So for assembly, for mustering and for fairs and for potentially uh, the collection of tribute and uh, traded goods. So rather than using hill forts themselves as those defensible locations, is Office Dyke actually about the hydraulics of managing streams and managing their power as well, perhaps also mills on these locations. My sixth and final point is more speculative, and that relates to the potentially sacred 
associations of watercourses in this landscape. Now with Wattsdyke we have a greater hint and this may be a coincidence and later back projection but the association of the north end of Wattsdyke, it's the smaller sister monument or brother monument of Offers Dyke that hits the D estuary at a possible site of the for, uh, the, uh, the fortification of the people of Baza, Bazing work that became a later Cistercian Abbey and the well of St Winifred's. Now, both of those features may be 12th century and later only, and there may have been nothing here in the 8th, 9th century when Watts Dyke was being added to this landscape, making its seaward approach, its estuarine approach, um, going at least as far as this fortification, which one idea is that there was a Mercian sea fort here. That's part of the reason why the dyke is coming to this location. But there is also the possibility that the waters of Holywell had an earlier pre-Christian and then Christian tradition of association, if not necessarily with St. Winifred, with um, some other, um, or other plural, um, deities or uh, saints or spirits. And so all I can say is, are we perhaps, should we at least start to entertain the, the the dikes are not only navigating landscape in terms of socio-economic and in terms of military design, but also trying to use the sacrality of water and the flow of water and cult sites associated with it. Now, for Offa's dike, there's no comparable convincing evidence, although Ray and Bapti already make the point that the line of Offa's Dyke, one of its demonstrable things in blocking the Vale of Llangollen, is to separate Bangor on Dee in its famous early monastic site that we know was established by at least the, the early 7th century and perhaps the, had, had early origins than that, um, from the Welsh kingdoms that may have been patronising and seeing it as, as a, a sacred. This is the modern church of... Well, post-medieval church and medieval fragments of the church of Bangor on Dee. The exact location of the monastery is unknown, but we're on the Dee, downstream um, east of that highly defensible um, horseshoe loop of the Dee, um, at just south of Roabon at Tim Hour, um, Kev Kevin Mau, which I showed you before. And so this is an ecclesiastical landscape of, of wealth and power that is being blocked by the line of Offa's Dyke. And so I do think uh, this is not my argument. This is Ray and Baptiste, but I, I, I just want to make the point that as if we're thinking in watery terms of Offa's Dyke, we have to think about more than just socio-economic and military design. We have to think about the potential for both these monuments, Offa's Dyke and Watts Dyke, is about their relationship with water may have had sacred or symbolic associations too. Let me sum up my arguments in my presentation. In its design and use. Offa's Dyke is hydraulic. It may have not run from sea to sea, and that's still to be debated, but it's all about coastal and river ends and the relationships um, to them and the broader seascapes that those and communication routes linking land and sea. And I would argue that we've got to stop seeing Offa's Dyke as simply about Mercia and the Welsh, but see it as about a monument that controlled and communicated to rival Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, the Irish Sea and um, the, the Bristol Channel and these the peoples in those maritime economies and societies. We've seen the rivers acting as part of the monument, a key point along its route. We've seen how it utilises ravines and valley sides to good effect to dominate uh, river courses and uh, the valleys in which they use. We've seen how it blocks rivers carefully and precisely. And I've argued that, if anything, streams and rivers are very carefully utilised into the line of the monument. And I've also suggested that in some occasions that there's a deviation in its behaviour and that sometimes the dike is creating islands to its east, crafted from the bank and ditch and uh, the confluence of two or more streams or rivers. And could these have been therefore an integral part of the design of the monument to allow places, secure places for fairs, mustering sites, assembly practices and... Um, the gathering of tribute and traded goods. 
And finally, a bit more speculative, I suggest that maybe we should think about the holy or sacred associations of containing controlling ecclesiastical sites and their environs um, by the placing of the linear earthwork in this landscape, that this was as much a symbolic appropriation of the landscape as an economic or social and a military one. Now, there are many still outstanding set questions, and we're heavily hindered by the fact that, you know, the dike is badly preserved in the sections where it intersects with watercourses. Um, were they, there's other questions. Were, was there a deliberate defensive redirection of watercourses? You know, were the damming of watercourses used for ponding and, and water power? causeways bridges and gates how did the dike look when it approached and crossed water courses was this linked to river transport using barge gutters and blind blind loads you know features of later centuries you know, we just need to we need to we haven't found evidence for this but we need to at least be looking uh for the at the landscape around the dike as potentially containing mercian eighth ninth century uh, other hydraulic engineering feats and if we don't look for it we'll never find them Right, that's me finished. So, as I said, I want this to be a two-part conversation with uh, the audience, um, uh, for, for my YouTube audience. Get in touch with, uh, look, read, watch both videos if you can, and get in touch if you have any questions. I don't may not have the answers, but I should try my best. But for the uh, Chester Society for Landscape History, I will be conducting a, a live follow-up discussion of Offers Dyke, what it, who built it, why, and how it may have been interacting in all these different ways with uh, water. Thank you very much for your time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition, consider following the Archeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.